Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. You're listening to Top Traders Unplugged, where I continue my conversation with Scott Billington, co-founder and managing partner of Covenant Capital Management. You talk about time frame. You talk about these long-term time frames, and um, yeah, I, 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 I can imagine it's not easy to get investors to to share that horizon so to speak because if you want to take not easy out and replace it with impossible yeah. then you'd be correct yeah but that's the business that i've chosen sure i i mean i know full and well that the next time we get hot mm. for 24 months yeah. will attract a lot of money mm. that's a fact yeah and the next We'll keep attracting money as long as we, quote unquote, stay hot. Mm. And then the next time we have a, you know, a drawdown, which will come, that's guaranteed, mm. and it'll last for X amount of period, we'll lose a mm. third of the money that we had. Yeah. That's just the fact of the matter. I mean, we attempt, we try, we talk about these things with our clients, but, but it is probable that the homo sapien is not particularly hardwired very well for trading why did you choose such a difficult path scott <laughs> no one's ever called me a smart person <laughs> uh they're obviously huge advantage i mean the the industry is extremely high paying yeah i like the i've always been interested you know interested in I remember when I was like 10 or 11 years old, my mom tells a story that I was homesick from school and I told her to go to the library and bring home every book on gambling she could find. Okay. And I distinctly remember being like 11 or 12 and sitting with a notebook and, and a book open trying to find some system to beat a roulette wheel. Mm -hmm. So I've always been attracted and had a, a decent aptitude for... for mathematically based but unknown future outcomes right and so that that lends it you know in our society that that lends itself towards trading and investments <laughs> and you know it's a so you know if i find the thing fascinating i also find it fascinating to to be able to to you know it takes a lot of discipline yeah and it takes a lot of self-control because I have opinions like anybody else. Mm. And, and, and I will think, oh, God, we got this trade. This one can't win. They, 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 you know, this and that's going to happen. And the Russians invaded this and this will never win. <laughs> and, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a challenge. I mean, there's the huge advantage, I think, to a systematic method is that it's an achievement to be able to put those things aside and continue to methodically apply our method. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think people. Are if there. I was going to say, there's anything that I'm proudest of that we've mm -hmm. done at Covenant Capital, and we hit on it earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, go look through your hedge funds and see how many of them lost twenty percent their second year. Yeah, the answer is one, and mm -hmm. that's ours. Yeah, and we did not change our trading philosophy a bit. Yeah, we did not change following the method a bit, and we actually, you know, I made fun of the in case of emergency break glass but we had taken the time to write that out and we actually mm. did it yeah and more than that it worked sure because here we are yeah. and and the real tragedy would have been assuming we do have a reasonable model in the future or the 
ensuing 15 years argued that we did sure. is if we'd had to fold that. Yeah. And most people would have. Yeah. And by most, probably 90%. So yeah. that's, you know, that's a time I'm really, I'm, I'm very proud of. And we've, we've developed our business in a vacuum. I mean, we're headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> you really couldn't have picked something worse. <laughs> and, you know, we've got an office in Chicago, but, but, you know, Brent and I have lived in different towns yeah. since 2002. You know, we have, neither of our dads was a partner at Goldman Sachs. We right. did not have, you know, it didn't like we went and worked for, you know, George Soros and then spun off and somebody kicked us $50 million day one. Mm. You, you know, we really did build this up from a bootstrap kind of in a vacuum. And like I said, in retrospect, we never should have tried it, but mm. we did. And, and at least thus far, it's worked out pretty well. And, you know, those are, those are the things I'm, I'm probably proudest of personally of what we've done with this. Yeah. And we've really stuck to our guns and, and we've had a th- you know, there's always, you know, I remember in the mid 2000s, everybody was investing in option sellers. Right. So everybody I ran to, well, it's an option seller. You got to do this. And I'm like, you realize all of those guys are going broke. No, no, no. This guy's figured it out. <laughs> sure he did. But, but, but option sellers aren't gone. And they're not every, I mean, some of them, I mean, I'm not sure. saying that I'm not picking, but in general, most of that's got it vetted out. And, and, you know, I suspect those may be coming back. The market has been going up lately, but you, you know, short term, oh, you got to get short term. You got to get this mean reversion, short term trading. This is, this is the new thing. And they'll think of some reason. Oh, well, the central bank now, because of that, this doesn't work anymore. I could pull out a futures magazine from 1991 declaring trend following dead. Mm. And if you really think about it, when you if you wanted to scientifically look at it and talk about repeatability, mm. uh, peer reviewed, you know, meaning that peer reviewed ability to repeat it, trend following is probably, with the possible exception of value stock, and uh, you know, the most successful method that's ever been created. Mm. It has been replicated time and time and time again. But I mean, it's just a slightly dis- different uh, topic than, than than where we start. But I think it's an important one, so I'd like to explore it a little bit. And although you probably know that that my bias is, of course, also uh, that I think you know trend following is is a highly robust and and sustainable strategy. If I was going to take the opposite side of the discussion here. Um, And that is because we obviously hear the argument every time that people say, oh, trend following is dead and and out comes the the veterans of the industry and saying, yeah, we heard this before and it never comes true. But we also know that decompression of or compression of uh, volatility is not great for for trend followers. And we have to admit, maybe with you as one of the exceptions, but we have to admit that some of the people who've been around for 20, 30 years have had significantly larger drawdowns in the past few years than they've seen in their 30-year career. Some of them have even folded uh, and and stopped because they thought it was going, it, it was getting, you know, too difficult. So th- the question is, of course, can can one always argue and say, yeah, sure, it's going to come back, it's it's going to be fine. I mean, or is there, as you alluded to before, I mean, I, I guess there is always the risk that, you know, markets uh, or, or something um, has actually fundamentally changed i'm not saying i'm i'm a strong believer here i'm just saying no, that i mean that that's it's, listen in the in the midst of any drawdown that will always be a great and valid question mm. and and i always start by saying look there is i don't know the future yeah i can make my best guess i would argue vehemently that my guess is very rational mm. but just because something has worked doesn't mean that it will work forever mm. across any board. We would be out of business long before there was enough statistical evidence to suggest trend following didn't work. Right. I mean, if you took the position today that trend following doesn't work, that would be an extraordinarily irrational statement mm. because the empirical evidence before you strongly suggests that it does. Yet a lot of investors take that stand, and that's of course my they do. yeah. Right, but but they they bought tons of collateralized debt obligations, 
right? So they did, yeah. I mean, hundreds of trillions of dollars of them. Yeah. They ran models that, that didn't even have an assumption possibility of a real estate price going down. Mm. And, and again, it's easy to pick on things in retrospect. Sure. But we all also, I mean, we also bought lots of Enron stock, mm. didn't we? But if we look at, I mean, if we if we talk about sort of evidence, and 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 I think we both agree that certain market environments uh, is not good for for trend following, and and certainly compression of volatilities is is one of them. So I don't um, know why that I don't our stuff volatility is bad. I, I mean, except I mean, it depends. But you, know, you want volatility post trade entry, right? Not pre. Yeah. So volatility pre trade entry is bad. Mm. And and ultimately, volatility tends to increase as a trend increases. Mm. So I think people have for years – now, I have not studied this, so this is a hypothesis of mine. But I think people have totally it, – it's like lightning makes my driveway wet because every time I see lightning, my driveway is wet. Mm. Sure. I, I think that that when silver gets to 50 – volatility goes up a lot mm. but the trend follower has made money because silver got to 50 not because volatility went up so it's a correlation right. rather than a causation sure and the best trends the ones where you make the most smoothest money are kind of the period bef right before it goes crazy sure when it just goes up a little bit kind of every single week yeah Nobody really talks about it for a while, and here it goes and goes. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think it's a perfect example. I don't think volatility compression. I mean, now if you mean volatility, meaning the high in crude oil over the last two years is 104 and the lows 89, yes, that's not very good. That's sure. a choppy sideways market. Yeah, it's price range compression, I guess. I'm referring. Okay, now to, yeah. then, sure. The, if there yeah. aren't big trends, yeah. then trend followers aren't going to do well. I exactly. Would, that, that would be very difficult to argue against. Yeah, no, absolutely. but I would say this is what people forget is. Your largest drawdown is always in front of you, mm. except you're going to retire or die at some point, <laughs> right? Sure. I mean, I mean, if I had traded, let's say that my grandkids went on to trade our method, there will be a far larger drawdown between now and my great grandkids trading my model than I've seen in my model up to now, because mm. it's more time. Yeah. Right. There are more instances. Sure. Now, there will also be a winning period better than we've seen. Yeah. So the idea that well, someone's having their largest drawdown than they've ever had, therefore this doesn't work, well, did it not work when they had their last largest drawdown? And why did we think they were never going to have a drawdown larger than their previous largest? Because mm. my returns are going to be distributed – and, and in any trading, the variance is so much larger than the drift. You got to remember that like 2.5% of the time, I'm going to be three deviations to the bad. Mm. Well, that's terrible performance. I mean, so I think that, that there are so many things here. I mean, the first is trend following gets held to a standard. If the stock market got held to that standard, the S&P wouldn't exist. I mean, I'll just take us, for example. Sure. We made equity highs in May of 13. Yeah. Okay. And we're probably, I, I don't keep, you know, 15% off that high. Yeah. And you're questioning, or not you, but, but yeah, yeah. one, quite like, well, does what you do even work anymore? And, <laughs> and that's where I get back to the statement is, we make our money from the fat tail distribution of price moves, and there's a slight dependency in price moves. Mm. Okay. All trend followers, yeah. we would argue, do. Okay. That evidence is evidenced across all markets. We trade yen the same way I trade cotton and cocoa. Mm. Across decades of time, I think AQR did a study that I'm sure you're familiar with that sure. went back hundreds of years, and it doesn't prove, but that suggested that trend following would have worked. Mm. There are definitely anecdotal examples of I – mean, I can't imagine trend following in Civil War cotton wouldn't have been pretty good. <laughs> and certainly the South Sea bubble and things yeah. like that. So there's reasonable level you know, that, that, that this 
idea of large outlier moves, I mean, the fat tail distribution of price moves is as academically verified as anything that could possibly be. Now, that doesn't mean it has to happen in the future, mm. right? But so you've got this massive body of evidence. Furthermore, I mean, if you think about a scientific, like if you did a chemistry experiment and you said, hey, A plus B equals C, the, the big thing to prove your experiment would be, could your peers run the same experiment and get the same results, mm. right? Yeah. So now think about trend following. It has been almost without question the most repeatable method of trading probably ever invented. Mm. Not only through all the turtles, but I mean, guys like me, I was like, oh, well, most of these people are trend followers. Let's try that. <laughs> sure. I mean, we challenge, I mean, so we think that whatever it is that made all that work ended May 31st of 2013. Mm. Really, that was the day. <laughs> It's a very, very interesting discussion, isn't it? Because you and I agree on the answer to that, yet most of the world don't. Niels, what I would yeah. say is, is, is it's hard. I mean, obviously anybody can disagree with what they want. Sure. But, but what is your basis for dis? I mean, what, lo what is your logical reasoning for the, that change that day? Mm. And then I would simply say, like, look, here's the monthly variance of my returns, our performance. I mean, we're not even two deviations to the bad. Sure. In fact, it's shocking that we've done – that we haven't had a worse period, to be honest with you. <laughs> CTAs and trend following, they're really the ugly, redheaded stepchildren of the financial world. Right. All the – Markowitz and all those guys and all their bull about efficient markets and all this. The idea that I could slap a couple of moving average on a chart and make money is it's abhorrent to them. Mm. They would want to vomit. <laughs> it's really the case. Sure. And I might not make enough for the risks that I, I mean, I don't, but I can turn a profit. Mm. You see what I mean? Sure. And furthermore, these, you know, Massive law. I mean, they're not even that massive. You're talking about being down. I think we lost two percent last year. Hmm. Well, we spent three and a half in 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 transaction costs. Sure. Now that doesn't do a lot for our client. I mean, we obviously hope to do better. But if if your idea is I'm going to invest in trend following, I'm never going to lose more than ten percent in a year. You need to find something else. Yeah. That's not for you. And I, I'd even go so far to say, and you need to stay away from mark to the market passive investments. Yeah. The reason that that you may have had this small business that has made a bunch of money is no one was in your front yard with a bid and offer on your business every day. Mm. So you didn't see the fluctuations that actually occurred. Same with houses. Sure. I mean, you see what I mean? Sure. So, I mean – Warren Buffett gets to have 50% drawdowns apparently on a <laughs> twice a decade. Sure. And, and he gets quoted and, you know, he's and, – and I'm not saying he isn't a marvelous investor or whatever. But what I'm saying is we get held to this standard that it doesn't seem equal. Yeah. Now, um, we've talked about sort of very broadly uh, about the, the entries and, and so on and so forth. And I, I just want to talk about one more thing about that. And it's a little bit about uh, position sizing. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate the importance of position sizing, but I'm not so sure with your strategy how you view that. I mean, is, is part of the success of a system like yours the way you size the positions? Well, once you have a non-random method of entry and exit, and that could be my macroeconomic analysis, mm -hmm. or it could be my insider knowledge of a recent crop report. Mm -hmm. But once I've got that, my whole outcome is going to be determined by position sizing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would far rather have a small edge with proper position sizing than vice versa. I mean, in fact, if you missize your positions, you can actually turn a positive expected outcome into a loser. Mm. Like, let's imagine that you and I were flipping a coin, mm -hmm. and I was going to pay you six to five on heads. Right. But you risk 30% of your bankroll on every flip. Mm. 
So you got a thousand dollars and you risk three hundred mm-hmm. and you win, right? So you yeah. get times one point two, you get three sixty, now you got thirteen sixty, you risk thirty percent, that's four oh eight, and you lose. Mm. You're down to nine fifty two. You have edge and you did not have bad luck. Mm. The expected outcome came. Sure. But you lost money. Yeah. Because you're risking too much. Now to me, that is a, an insightful and frightening and kind of amazing like, wow, I risked too much, and I took a winner and turned it into a loser. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So for every example you could have where, where there are an unknown future wins and losses, there's a perfect amount you should risk, an optimal level. Mm. And I think in my coin flip example, I think it's 8%. I think if you risk 8%, you make more money. And if you risk nine, you even make less than if you risk eight. Okay. Because that's in the nature of geometric returns. If I lose 20, I got to make 25 to get back. Sure. Had you figured this out from the outset? Did you know uh, the importance of, of position sizing it? And, and has that changed a lot over time? Yes, I knew the importance of it. And the way we've done it has not changed there's some things we do now, I think, in the way we size the position and the way we look at risk that, that I think are, you know, miles ahead of what we used to do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we, we always have used the standard fixed fraction of the account size to risk. Mm. And I've always been aware of what our optimal level was. Mm. And, and, you know, because risk to return is not a linear, you know, it's not a linear function, which you can see from the from the the coin flip example but but risk of ruin and volatility or you know and losses are how do you manage the risk with such a long time frame how do you when you put on a position i assume you you have some level of stop loss um, but uh, that i'm yeah, not you're just gonna have, so you're gonna you're gonna put a position on you're gonna have a point at which you get out and then we're gonna look at Basically, we look at every position to every stop every day, and we say that's the amount of money we have at risk. Yeah. And then we have maximums on a position and a portfolio level, and if we hit those maximums, then what we do is reduce position size to, to fit them back under the curve. Can you shed some light on just to give sort of our listeners a, a, an idea of what that risk looks like? I mean, how, how big a risk or, 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 or indeed how small a risk do you actually see uh, in running a portfolio like this? Well, that and that's where we get into, I mentioned, you know, the original program has a 25% maximum. Right. The aggressive has a 30 and the optimal has a 95. Right. So that's exactly how we change between programs. Okay. And then, you know, obviously, if an investor wanted some number in between there, we could either create it for them or they could invest X amount in, you know, one and a different in another. Do you treat risk individually by market? Meaning, so you put on a position in corn and you have a certain level of risk and you manage your trailing stop. um, But you you treat that independently of what's going on in other parts of the maybe the same sector or other parts of the portfolio. I think what we've basically found is for trend following, our markets tend to correlate higher when they matter to us. Mm. So like when I'm in a position, that's, I mean, I don't care about corn and silver's correlation when, when I'm not in them. Yeah. Right. And I really don't care when I'm in them. The main time they're going to be, you know, risk is going to build in a position as a trend goes our way. Mm. So our stop's not going to move up as quickly as the market might move in our favor. Sure. So when the risk of positions really matters to us is when they're in the midst of of decent-sized winning trades, right? Because yeah. risk is built up in, in multiple positions at the same time. Yeah. And what we found is, is when that occurs, the correlations of the markets increase mm-hmm. so that, you know, Silver and corn might show. I mean, the, the example I remember the best is in 2005. Right. We had a huge winning trade in the Nikkei and a huge winning trade in sugar. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't probably think of two markets you would think were more <laughs> different, would be more zero. But I can sure. promise you, when we were in them and those big trades were running up, they were correlated as they could. I mean, 
they were dead step and step. Right, right. And so what we think is when you do your sec, we basically assume that every sector is highly correlated. Okay. So when we look at it, we look at it on an individual position. Mm. Because again, we're looking at that optimal level. We're saying, I know in our method that I never want to risk more than X on a given position. Because mm. that would be like risking the 30% in the coin flip. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I'm never going to let an individual. Then I also know as a portfolio as a whole, I never want to risk more. You know, you know, the way we're going to control drawdown is at no time from an equity high are we ever going to risk more than a preset level of your account's value. Mm. Does that make you see what I mean? Sure. Does it worry you that what you described there is probably the exact opposite of what big financials, you know, institutions do in terms of managing risk where they put everything together and they try and work out some kind of smart expected risk taking into account all sorts of parameters which we know <laughs> that when uh, you know things get tough um, never work well then no <laughs> <laughs> how are they done with that yeah i mean that's we look at risk as, as a on a much what i i mean there's no reason for me to look at a derivative risk right i know where the market is and i know where i'm getting out yeah that's the money i have at risk mm. So that's the money that needs to be that needs to be controlled. Yeah. And so I, I don't know why I would go a step beyond that. No, no, I agree. And uh, but I, I do think that it's interesting that um, that the systemic risk, at least I would say, in the system seems to be increasing with the way that uh, a lot of people are looking at risk, which is actually completely opposite of what many CTAs are doing and, yeah. and so on. And so I mean, forth. I think in those, you know, in those situations, basically you have people that are looking for an excuse to put more on yeah. because they, they get paid on the upside and they don't have to pay the downside. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if I'm the head of bonds at, at I mean, we saw that. I mean, I'm, I'm the head of bonds at Bear Stearns. I acted exactly as a rational person should have. Mm. I came up with every reason in the world to put on as much risk as possible. I made $75 million dollars. My company went bankrupt, and I walked away with $52 million. Yeah. Like, that's a winner. And then really, if you think about it, none of them ever had any edge. They were all trading randomly. Sure. But they got to, you know, so way they set up a, a – they, they chose a trading method with a high frequency of winners and a terrible winner-to-loser ratio. Mm. And they knew – like, if you said to me, hey – I got your daughter captive, and you need to make 20% next year, period, like, or in the next six months. You sure. got to make 20%, and your daughter's captive, or, or she's done for. Mm. I would immediately start selling options. Sure. Because I know that's the highest likelihood of my making 20%. Mm. And my making 15 and my losing 100, they have the same outcome. Sure. My daughter's in trouble. Sure, sure. Well, that's the, that, that's a, officer with a, any publicly traded financial firm. Yeah. They there, have basically the same deal. Yeah. Is there anything that you worry about Scott when you sort of uh, go to sleep at night in terms of risk and when you when you look at sort of your your own methodology or or are you just completely comfortable with, you know, the way it's designed and 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 tested or is there something where you can see yeah if, if this happened, you know, that that wouldn't be good. Well, sure. I mean, we've got positions in markets, and and we've had mornings that weren't good. Yeah, lots of them, and we'll have lots more. Mm. But that I, I think what I try to get comfortable with, and I don't want anybody to sound like I'm the booter or something, and I don't have emotional reactions to wins and losses. Mm. But w what I try to get comfortable with is you have to take risk mm. in your whole existence. You have to take risk. And so, once you've established the fact that risk exists and I can't avoid it, then I basically say, okay, how can I control it to the point that I'm comfortable with, like, look, th this is the most that I can control this thing, you know? I mean, I would tell a client, don't invest more than you can lose. Mm. I don't. So in our own programs, I've got an amount invested that if I lost it, I wouldn't like it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, but 
it, it, my family and all is going to be more or less okay. Mm. I mean, I don't, and we do, we don't borrow any. I mean, you know, we do think. I mean, I do things to try to be robust. And at the end of the day, I look at it and I say, hey. We have stops in place. I know that we could get gaps through them, but they're, the gaps are, you know, we've got a risk level that I'm comfortable with taking, knowing full and well if I trade long enough, eventually we'll lose most of what we, you know, have at risk someday. Hmm. If you trade long enough, I mean, I, I, I would probably take three generations of my trading for that day to occur, but it could occur tomorrow, hmm. right? But then the idea is, is that, I mean, you know, there, there's a business side of thing and a trading side of thing. Yeah. For my own trading, what I realize is, is I, I don't put every dollar that I could put into our program into the program because if something like that happened, I would want to have dry powder left that I could still invest. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure. But it, to me, it's the idea of, look, you can't take risk out of your existence. Hmm. Particularly financially, I mean, how uh, those Veermark Deutschmarks don't spend very well these days. Like, <laughs> y- y- you know, y- you just don't know what the next ten years might hold. Sure, absolutely. Even five years. I mean, well, the one thing you could probably be assured of is things will happen, both good and bad, that are better and worse than you imagined could have happened. Sure, sure. A- and so that having been said. We take a, a risk level that we're very comfortable with, yeah. and and our money is at risk side by side with our clients' money, mm. and and you know, I am a big believer in the barbell strategy, which is very little money at risk, but the money that it's at risk is in the most aggressive things that it can be in. Mm. So, you know, I am a in our strategies, I, I and Brent and I both, we put all of our money in our optimal strategy. Mm. It doesn't make any, I mean, it sure. really makes very little sense not to. Sure. Because ultimately, with any manager, any investor, any anything, everything you invest is at risk. Mm. You might think, oh, this guy's never had a drawdown or this thing's never happened. But you put a million bucks in, you got a million bucks at risk. Sure. And that's probably the biggest mistake, in my opinion, that allocators make. They are obsessed with percentage returns, and they forget about dollar. Mm. And, and, and they say, oh, well, this thing is only has this volatility or this other thing, you know, and, and therefore it can't – and I, I'm going to put $10 million into that. And I, I think it's – I mean, it, it's, it's an inarguable point that you shouldn't put – $2 million into something that's just five times as aggressive. Sure. I wanted to not spend too much time because uh, on, on research because we've, we've talked about it already in a sense, but, but I do want to ask you one thing, and that's you're so long-term. I mean, in fact, your models can only generate a signal, you know, once a week, uh, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Being so long-term, I would imagine that it could be difficult to and 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 that means also doing so few trades uh relative to other people so i I, i'm sort of imagining that actually finding out what to do next in terms of research because it'll take a longer time for you to see the results of what you've already done and so on and so forth looking at the uh, the trading frequency or at least that's my impression how does research sort of what does a research cycle look like in 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 your world and 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 where where are you looking at the moment well i don't know that that's that your original premise is necessarily the case sure sure we i mean frankly there we're looking at say 50 markets over 30 years of doing our research that'd be 800 market years there won't be enough real time to to conflict with what those results are. Yeah. So in our research, we we try to constantly follow a process that looks at the strengths and weaknesses of what we do and, and tries to further enhance the strengths and tries to mitigate the weaknesses. 
and you know the initial process we we try to be uh very you know kind of open socratic discussion mm. and then if there's something that reaches a more formal stage then we try to be pretty adherent to the scientific method with it writing a hypothesis and and determining what tests will be done determining what will would prove the or disprove the hypothesis you know and then and then moving forward from there mm. but but as a pure trend follower if i can call you that you where, can. <laughs> where do you uh, where do you see the weaknesses in your opinion well we're going to be weak in at the end of trends mm. we could be better at perhaps better at short trades we're going to be weak in in sideways markets Mm -hmm. But well, I mean, again, it particularly sideways. You know, if there's a trend and then a sideways market, we're fine because we're just going to be in it and sit there. Mm. But when it's a sideways market that is electing signals, that's when we're going to lose money. Yeah. Um. You know, we're going to tend to be weak in in downward trending markets that have kind of short upward spikes that would elicit signals. Right. Yeah. But as you've noticed, what I keep having to mention is the word is illicit signals. Yeah. So lots of times we'll look at things like, you know, a, a spike up, but it doesn't really nothing really matters until it elicits a signal. Mm. But how is the balance between eliciting fewer signals, you know, there are also some advantages of taking more signals. So mm. So those kind of market environments, how do we do in those periods? Are you know, are we mitigating our losses as best we can, or are we are we maximizing our wins? Is you know what what I basically have found is is that if you were a cotton trader, nothing really mattered other than how you traded that move up to almost two dollars a few years ago. Sure, you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean you could have traded the heck out of it from sixty five to. 73 cents your whole life but if you got on the wrong side of that you lost everything billy dunman actually did every nickel you ever made you lost mm. you see what i mean sure and so if you were a mortgage trader it doesn't matter how you did other than 2008 did you get out right and, and so i'm a pretty big believer that it is the handling of the large moves is sort of all that matters right yeah And that, you know, when we take a losing trade, we lose, in essence, one unit of risk. Mm. But a winning trade might get up, you know, I might, be, I might be up 40 units, and my stop might be down at up 20 units. Yeah. Well, that one trade is the equivalent of 20 losers. Yeah. And if I got twice the position size on, that might make an 80 unit or a 40 unit. You see what I mean? Sure. Sure. So it's the the management and and position size and stop and create that kind of stuff. It's the management of your of your huge winners. The, those are super impactful. Mm. And, and so those there's other places. Is, is how can you manage those better intra trade? Yeah, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously. I mean, I mean, you see what I mean. Like, if I were able to avoid five losing trades. Sure. Well, if I could just capture a quarter of that extra profit on that big one I just mentioned, yeah. that eviscerates being able to live in, you know, those five losing trades. Yeah. What's a good win ratio for you? A 30%, okay. 33%. Okay. Now, on the sort of more business side of things, I mean, you mentioned that Nashville is uh, a difficult place to, to uh, I mean, great music, but maybe a difficult <laughs> place to uh, to be a CTA. And um, we talked about the long time frame and the patience that you're asking investors to have, which doesn't make it easier. Is that your biggest challenge uh, that, uh, that you have? And, and, and how are you overcoming this? Well, We don't have any desire to ever be the biggest manager in the world or in, in any – that's not our goal. Then let me interrupt you there and then rephrase it a little bit because uh, in a sense you've got a great business uh, today. You've got lots of assets on the management and, and you could argue that with the, with the clients you have, you don't need to be bigger. But 
a little while back, you definitely wanted to be bigger and you had the same challenges, meaning you were still in Nashville and you were yeah. still long term. So how did you overcome it at that time? Well, and we, I mean, the reason we need to be bigger now is that, is that you know that whenever you have a losing period, you're going to lose clients. Sure. And you never know, you know, your main contact at a big fund of funds takes another job. Sure. Or retire, you know. So, I mean, you need to build a buffer. And we, and we wouldn't mind being, I'd say, growing once again or, you know, you know, I, I really look, you know, for, in fact, our original and aggressive optimal programs, if, if you normalize their size to original, if they're at 100 and 75 million or whatever, mm. we probably wouldn't mind being 500 million. So there, okay. there's more growth that, that we would like to have. Okay. Um, so, so how do we get there? Do how think? do we get there is, is we have to understand who we are and, and who are not. Yeah. And we have to understand that we're a boutique. We are going to be attractive to certain people. And, and there are other people that we're never going to be attractive to. Right. And that, they, and and we need to not spend any resources and time or money or whatever trying to chase those people that you know. I do not have a science degree from a Ivy League institution, nor am I going to. Mm. And so I could hire a bunch of people that did, but ultimately, that's just not a a place in which we're attempting to fight. Right. We think that we are a very attractive option for a certain number of investors and that there are enough of those investors for us to manage the amount of money we'd like to. Mm. And so we need to make sure that those investors know that we exist. Right. And they know that we exist so that when they decide that they want some exposure to what we do, that they're aware of us mm. and that they have a, a positive image of us and that they have an accurate image of us. Mm -hmm. What do you think investors like the most about you, if I can ask you that question? Well, or let me put it this way. When you do get investors on board, what do you think convinced them that this, this is something I should be invested in? Because the trend following space is, it can be very, very hard to distinguish one you know, strategy from another they on the surface can look very similar, yet they're probably not. But what, what do you think people latch on to when they look at you guys? I mean, is it it could also be personal. I mean, personal reasons, you know. I other than my charming personality, Not I <laughs> uh I think I mean ultimately we've done better than most trend followers. Right. And and I think ultimately that's is something people are attracted to. Hmm. Uh, I think secondly that yeah, even maybe even primarily. And in, in addition, I think there are certain people that are attracted to the boutique. Right. There are a lot of uh, academic type articles that have come out in the last couple of years that make some pretty strong persuasive arguments for managers that are exactly the way we would def define boutique. Right. They're small enough to still be able to be nimble and use their trading strategies, but they're large enough that you don't have that they're not working out of their their mom's garage. Yeah. And so that there are some pretty strong arguments there and that and that so as those people if you're a fund to fund or an allocator or something like that as you're trying to differentiate yourself from your peers they have to look at it and say okay well if i go invest with the same eight giant managers i, I can't do better than the guys i'm trying to compete with hmm. so i have to offer something different yeah. if you're a huge uh, and this, you know, these aren't really the people we go after, but if you're a large pensiony kind of person, mm -hmm. you might look at it and say, you know what, I've got a lot of trend following beta from these giant managers. I can get that through one of these one and zero mutual funds. I'm going to go out and get some more, spe you know, a, a group of more specialized or, or of boutique guys that can maybe deliver a little bit different return stream. The other thing where we found that we have the most success is, is that the closer we are to the person whose money it really is, the better we tend to do. Mm. So if you're a consultant that's consulting a fund to fund who's, you know, and there are nine different intermediaries between the owners of the money and the trades being made, that doesn't tend to be our best prospect. Mm. But if it's your money, they tend to like us a lot better mm. because then they aren't 
thinking about how can I explain this to my investment board if it doesn't go well? Mm. They are thinking, does this guy have my best interest at heart? Is this guy honest? And does what he's saying make sense? Yeah. You see what I mean? Sure. And, and those are far different. And, and I don't hear that as critical of one or the other. Mm. They're far different people with a far different set of motivations. Mm. But we have found that the, the closer we are to the actual money, the better we the, the better our message sounds. And so it's our, you know, our job is to, to, I mean, our job is to run our business economically enough that, that we don't need $500 million to run it, mm. that we can thrive as a business with $50 million. Sure. So we try to do that. And then we need to make sure that the people who will find us interesting know about us. Yeah. Speaking of investors, um, when you meet them, when you talk to them, what are the questions that they are not asking you that you think that they really should ask you? I don't think they ask enough qualitative questions. Like um, what? Like what? Give me an example. What? What? How many parameters do you use in your method? Right. If you change your parameters by five percent, what kind of effect does that have on your returns? Mm. Let me see your back adjusted returns. Okay, now I want you to change this parameter and this one by eight percent one way and four percent the other way. Let me see those. Would you do that? Well, sure. Okay. I mean, but I mean, because now I'm speaking to robustness. Mm. How, why did you pick the number that you picked? Mm. Meaning, if I'm if I'm using a 50-day window for whatever, whatever, well, how did I pick 50? Yeah. Well, how did 49 do? Mm. How's 45 do? How does 40 do? Mm. And what you know, you're what you're really hoping for there is a is a smooth kind of plateau. Sure. And hopefully they've picked in the middle. That vein of question that that pushes out for repeatability and robustness as opposed to how do you protect your server? Well, what if somebody breaks into your office and gets Jonah's laptop? Mm. And again, those are fine questions. I mean, you need to you need to <laughs> thought of that. But there does seem to be a bit of, you know, we'll have entire weekends on operational due diligence. Mm. And then the trading due diligence is pretty, you get about the same thing every time. Yeah. I would also say is that I, I think probably they should have people with trading experience running those, yeah. not allocation exp- actual that have done their own trading, and and then they could bring up other pitfalls. Mm. For instance, if we traded a lot, they should say, "How do you handle costs?" Mm. We don't trade a lot, so the weakness of not trading a lot is we don't get a lot of compounding. We don't get enough instances. Mm. So they would say, "Okay, so one of the weaknesses of your prop model is." Since you are, what I found in trading, there's never a give without a take. Mm. So I want to minimize my cost to gross trade outcome ratio. Right. And to do that, I'm going to have to give up the number of instances I get in a given time period. Of course. It, it, number one, am I even aware of that? Yeah, sure. And and I would guess, you know, que- questions along, along those, those lines. Sure. Sure. I think you've hit on some interesting things like when did you make these changes? I think looking at a back test of the current model rather than – not rather than in combination sure, sure. with the, the realized returns. Getting into what were your luckiest periods? <laughs> yeah. Because it's true. Like, sure. oh, well, you, you know, what were your least lucky periods? Yeah, yeah. If you really wanted to get into it, I would get in. I would take each parameter out look at them individually, look at them. And, you know, I don't know that we would, that's the way I would, you know, when those guys come to me, I mean, the first thing that happens when people come to me with their methods and they're always short term is I always say, okay, what's your winning percentage? Mm. It's always over 50. Mm. What's your winner loser ratio? Oh, it's two to one. Mm. I'm like, so you make 60% of your winners and it's two to one and you do 6,000 trades a year. <laughs> yeah. And then I go, why are you talking to me? Yeah. Because if you took $25,000 and traded that for nine months, you would have $86 billion. Mm. 
And it's literally always something like that. <laughs> and like, so, and maybe that does work. I, I'm not saying it doesn't, but sure. you certainly don't need me. You need 25 grand. Yeah. In fact, 10 grand. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, and so you know, that's usually it. And then if it gets past that, I'll say, okay, well, what's your first input? Mm. I don't know. It's proprietary. I'm like, okay, well, you don't even have to tell me what it is, but tell me what the edge of this input is. Right. What is this input versus trades without this input? Mm. And you don't even need to, you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Walking through that piece by piece for each parameter, you know, I would never take, you know, limited parameters. Do you trade this on all markets? Mm. No, the only the S&P. Well, does it work on the Dow and the NASDAQ? I mean, hopefully that one at least is yes. <laughs> well, does it work on Euro stocks and Nikkei? I mean, maybe you could make an argument that equity markets, you know, why well, have you tried it on silver? Well, why, you know, you know that kind of thing, again, towards robustness. Hmm. I want to jump to sort of the last section of, uh, of our conversation. And I... I call it general and fun, and uh, it's partly sharing your experience, partly getting to know certain things about yourself. But I want to start off by just asking, I mean, you've been there, you've done it, and um, you've seen probably, you know, both all the ups and, and all the downs. What what advice would you give to someone aspiring to start today, you know, 15 years after you started and with a probably a different uh you know it's a it's a different ball game out there today what what advice would you uh would you give them well i would probably i would talk first about their business plan do you have enough money enough operational capital to last for five years without any income right if you don't you need to go raise that yeah that's going to be prime i mean that that alone is going to solve a lot of your problems yeah. Uh, what are your goals? How big do you want to be? Mm. If you want to be giant, do you have the, you know, they talk about the pedigree and things like that. Like <laughs> at the end of the day, was your grandfather rich enough for you to be that, you, you know, like, do you have those kind of connections that, that that's reasonable? Mm. And if not, then you probably need to change your goals back. Yeah. Cause I can promise you, you could return 30% a year for a decade, I mean, maybe not for, but in 1999, if you had told me we did as well trading as we've done, I would have thought that I would have had probably a hundred times more money than I have. Yeah. And that isn't to say, I mean, we've been successful. It's great. Sure. I'm happy. But, but if you'd said, oh, well, you'll do this over this period, I'd have been like, oh, well, I'll have my own Learjet. Like, yeah. and so first is you got to make sure you got enough money to let your business you know, I think about the old Charlie Brown. I, do you guys know Charlie Brown? Sure. That Christmas, the old Christmas tree one, they hang that ornament on it and it droops all the way over. I think if any new business is like a small tree, it cannot take a tire swing yet. Right. And the needing to support a family and yourself on that kind of income from that business is like a tire swing. Mm. So by having enough operational capital that you can exist for, uh, I like five years, that's going to give your tree time to sprout roots and grow and, and not put immediate pressure on it. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you know, in the partners that you've brought in or, you know, if there is a team, do you have a, a sales, a person that's kind of more a natural born salesman? Mm -hmm. If so, that's going to be useful. Do you have somebody that has a, reputable science degree that's going to be useful uh can you program and uh, you know i'm none of these things but <laughs> but uh in other words look at me and then do the opposite um because programming is you know that's going to be an irreplaceable tool sure is part of your success just out of curiosity and and this is with the warmest intention i ask this question mm -hmm. is part of the success in a partnership the fact in a sense that you and prince actually live apart do you know what i mean it's kind of like you know uh, in a marriage you know sometimes you do need to get away from each other to <laughs> yeah. uh, to make it work brince and i were really good friends before we were business partners yeah and before becoming business partners we spent a lot of time making sure that our philosophies and goals for the company matched 
Yeah. And we still spend a lot of time every year going over what are your goals for this company? What are your goals personally? Where are you financially? Mm. In our operating agreement, neither one of us is allowed to take on personal debt without the other's okay. Right. And, and so I think we were pretty smart in laying that stuff out. We've written every, you know, even though we were friends, yeah. we wrote every agreement down because yeah. you forget. Yeah. Our outlooks on things matched very well from the get-go. Mm. And we have spent a lot of time making certain that, you know, when we started the business, we were both single and I could live in a, you know, 55 square foot apartment sure. with occasionally running water. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, now, you know, when you start adding families and children and, and as those things change, we need to stay on top of, you know, before Scott managing 150 million was enough for you. Mm. Is that, or is that too much? Yeah. Would you rather, you, you know, cause that's going to come with more time. I mean, you know, sure. how do you want this to be? I mean, we, uh, we existed and we didn't hire, we probably existed for seven or eight years before we hired our first employee. Yeah. And now we have them do things that we would rather not spend time doing, Sure. Uh, you know? And, and so, and we've hired them for skill sets that, that they have that we don't. Mm. So I, I think, uh, a very honest and making sure that you fit. There are definitely people who I like a lot as people mm. that I could never be business partners with. Yeah. And if Brent's and my financial goals diverged sharply, mm. you know, that, you know, that would, that we'd have to really spend time talking what that, about what that meant. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the size of firm you're going for is going to, is going to, you know, if Brent said, you know what, I want to buy the Cubs. And so <laughs> I need to make $2 billion. Yeah. Well, we're going to then have to, you know, then now stuff's going to have to change, you know, like going to change, going to have to change a lot. Yeah. And then we're going to have to, you know, hire and, 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 I don't know that I'd be necessarily that psyched about a lot, you know, I mean, that, that, that would be very different. Or if he said, you know what, Scott, I've, I'd be perfectly happy trading $10 million. Sure. Well, I want to manage more than that. You know, so, yeah, yeah. you know, although I can remember the day when managing $10 million seemed like, oh my gosh, if I could ever just yeah. manage $10 million, yeah, it sure. would just be. And so, you know, I, I think all of those things have to match very well on a business side. Mm. And so, you know, the advice I would give someone is first, you have to go through your trading model mm. like that then you've got to go through your business plan like mm. that yeah. but i would probably if they had designs on being you know a 10 billion dollar firm unless they were well connected and already had the the you know the things that help you up that ladder i would strongly discourage it yeah and in fact, in general, I would probably discourage it now. It, it's a, it's a hard business to to. Well, I mean, it pays a lot, so it's, you know, it's like being an actor. Like, you know, it, it's it's hard, and you need some. You're going to need some good luck. Yeah. Because you're not going to attract any money until you have a couple lucky years. Sure. Because you're expected isn't going to be good enough because someone's going to be getting lucky. Yeah. You see what I mean? Sure. Sure. And, and, you know, so I, I think that rather than starting it the way we did, it's probably advisable to spend some time working with some smaller and then larger firms and try and making those kind of contacts and trying to spin it out from there. Mm. Do you have any personal habits that you uh, think have been part of your success? Something you do every day uh, or, or maybe your di maybe your discipline? I don't know what it might be. I. You know, a lot of people try to I read some books and things that, that a lot of people try to make trading out to be something that's almost like mystical. <laughs> and I'm sure in your travels, you've run it. I'm not a big, I, I don't go for that. Mm. I, you know, to me, again, it gets down to something pretty simple. You've got to have a non-random way of entering and exiting markets. Mm. From there, you have to appropriately risk given the amount of edge or non-randomness you can capture. Yeah. The more you've got, 
and and winning percentage does come into play here. But the more you've got, the little bit more you can risk. And more importantly, then you've got to have the discipline to follow the thing that you know works. I mean, the greatest poker player in the world, if he didn't make the plays that he knew were the proper ones, wouldn't be the greatest poker player. You see what I mean? Absolutely. So you've got to have the discipline, or I don't know that I have the discipline. So I've created a system yeah. rather than making discretionary decisions. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what? And I mean, now we have hired someone that actually makes the trading that does the actual trades. Mm. And so that further gets it away from my emotions and, the, and one of the Coke system creators, et cetera. Um, but once you've got those things, and they are, I mean, I think they're simple but difficult. Sure. I don't think you need to get into this super psychological or I, I mean. No, no. I, I, that's, you know, those things are great. I mean, you know, I, I, I will say that trading's. An, I read an interesting book on the biology of trading. Right. And it went into the the electrochemical reactions that are going on in testosterone and cortisol and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, it's a very stressful endeavor, mm. and and it's it's unlike other things in that I can't just start working harder to try to do better. Right. So I mean, I think that probably good health in in eating properly, exercising. Are, are probably advisable. Mm. It is a a profession that can lend itself to. I mean, I think you particularly want to avoid substance abuse, and and there's probably, you know, certainly down on the floor that kind of stuff was was out of hand. Yeah. But you know, there's this kind of cowboy mentality that goes with it. That's really a myth. But but that you would probably want to. Not you know you want to avoid that stuff anyways, but you particularly would want to avoid it if you were being a, if you were a trader. Sure, you know I, I think that keeping your you know what I would call your brain chemistry, keeping your yourself healthy is something I you know pay particular attention to, and and it's possibly helped me. But th- I mean that doesn't mean that a no, no. four hundred pound chain smoker couldn't also follow our system. <laughs> so I, you know I you know I. I don't know, and I, you know, I think it's funny, like the. Oh, I play chess with somebody to see. I, I, you know, I don't know about all that. I mean, I no, remember no. on the floor we would give them a pretty basic, a few pretty basic. I mean, I think you need to have an analytical mind. You need to be good with probabilistic thinking, and I think you need to be. There's a balance. I mean, getting out of losing trades is pretty important, yeah. <laughs> and so you need to not be so arrogant that. You can't stand. I mean, I lose seventy percent of our sure, trades. Sure. So you got to be okay with with admitting when you're wrong, and and it, you know. But but I think a probabilistic is the best way to look at it. Where you realize, like, you know, if you take sports, like, if a coach makes a decision and the team wins, that doesn't make that decision right. Mm. It, it could make the wrong decision. The team could have gotten lucky and won. You need to think of it as if we played this game from this point on 10,000 times and he made this decision 5,000 and he didn't make this decision 5,000, what are the outcomes there? I would say if your general thought process lends itself to that way of thinking, you, you probably have a, have a you know, you'd, you'd probably rather have that characteristic than not. Sure. I've only got actually two questions left that I wanted to uh, briefly ask you. And, and one is, you know, very simple, whether there is a fun fact that you can share about yourself, maybe even something that Brince does not know about you, even though you spent hours and hours together and know each other. Is there anything that you uh, can think of? I did not have a cell phone until I was 30, 40 okay. years old. Okay. And my wife was... I did not get married till late in life, and and my wife was pregnant with our daughter, and she finally said, "Listen, this silliness has to end." <laughs> yeah. uh, but so I did not. I am in general a. I much prefer a, a pad and paper and pencil. Yeah. To, you know, I had to go out and buy this headset today. Yeah. <laughs> to <win laughs> and I had, you know, I'm a. I had Skype. And I had one other person on it. I had yeah. one friend that that wanted me to 
to Skype him to look at something. Sure. And actually, he was an aspiring trader. He wanted me to be able to look at his computer. Yeah. And so uh, maybe the fun fact is I didn't have a cell phone until I was 40. As long as you have an iPhone so that you can listen to this podcast on your iPhone, that's… Uh... I, I do not have an iPhone, <laughs> but I will, uh, I'm will. i sure that… that android or whomever does my thing exactly make it available for me fantastic now final question now i asked you earlier today you know what are investors missing when they're trying to talk to you and and discuss uh, things around you what did i miss today if anything what uh, did i do you justice and and covenant justice in our conversation i think so i think you actually did a did a great job in hitting on things that I think are interesting. I think we did a great job of staying away from your typical due diligence. I don't remember mentioning a single statistic about Covenant, which I think is is great. Good. And I think you you have obviously done this before and and there's nothing that I can think of that that uh, I thought this was very well done. Great. Thank you so much. But- Conversational, low key, you know, I don't like the hard press selling and, and over promoting and over trumpeting of things. Sure. And I think we've been able to sit around and talk about covenant and our history and trading and off certainly offer opinions and, and things without, you know, banging our chest about some sharp ratio. <laughs> Great stuff. Now, but before we finish though, um, could you tell our listeners uh, where they can best uh, reach out to you and, and learn more about you and Covenant? Sure. Our, I mean, the website is covenantcap.com. Uh, I think the best way to get a general, you know, it's written in the same method and that we have a lot of papers on there that we've written in various opinions about different things. We try not to just throw up a bunch of statistics on somebody and you know if somebody went there and found it interesting and and wanted to talk further about investment uh, i think a, a call to the head office in nashville would be the second step great stuff and of course our listeners can also find all the details about our conversation today in the show notes uh, for this episode on top traders on plug.com and I uh, I also want to mention that for those who listen to this who are on the mailing list, they will receive uh, an email where there is a link. And this link can be used to say thank you to Scott for sharing his story, his expertise. And I really encourage you to do so. So let me be the first Scott to say thank you ever so much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it was incredibly interesting to to uh, take a different approach like we did today, um, but still be incredibly transparent and uh, and sharing your insights about uh, what you feel strongly about. And I think for people who listen carefully, they would have picked up quite a lot of really important information. So uh, I do appreciate that. And, and I hope we can connect at a later date and, and see how, how things are working out. Great, Niels. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I really like these uh, interviews you're putting forward. And, uh, and thanks again. You're welcome. All the best, Scott. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.